from last time I read that I wanted to seem to have not crept into everyone's ears rewrit version only those hoop snakes roll and thrive who find the sight of their own ass repellent yes. <laughs> civilizations unnoted motivation hoping that most of you are colloquial enough to know the colloquial stories regarding the so-called hoop snake. <laughs> now tonight, the tricky, tis tricky trying to travel when there's always someone telling you that. There's either nowhere to go or else you can't possibly get there. And it turns out that someone is you. <laughs> Such is the power, true though scary, of man's inner commentary. <laughs> there are two ways that you could look at this kind of activity, no matter when it was, where it was, and what it was called. That is, you could look at it as the experience, which is what everyone is after. However, they term it. You can look at it as the big E, the big experience, or you can look at it as also the getting there, which is ordinarily what is referred to as the practices, the methods, the effort. Now, the big E, by all accounts, and I'm not going to deny it, but the big E, by all accounts, is indescribable, which, of course, is why it is the big E. But the other, as far as the trip there, that is generally capable of being outlined. And the general outline, again, no matter what it's been called, I'm going to bring it up to date and give you a new version. The getting there amounts to one thing, and that is stopping the inner commentary. which is not divorced from the experience itself, but the effort itself can be described. It is not in the same category as the experience itself of saying, well, I can't tell you what it is. It's just indescribable. You have had a full history, east and west, of mystics describing to give us a starting place of seeing such things as the cause of all human pain and illusion, the causes are age, illness, death, loss, sorrow, <coughs> defeat, dejection, which about wraps it up. And yet they're not, because they are not actually mortally forms, mortal forms of pain or distraction until they are commented on. You have right there, any of you following this, I'm not necessarily going to name names of the so-called past mystics and historical figures because it's of no importance, but you have a wrap-up of all of the East and now most of what amounts to a Western tradition of mysticism, transcendental thought, philosophy, practice, that it has always been stated more or less that the causes of human suffering, and you would do well to take that in the widest sense. Remember, we're talking about human suffering. And they say such things as age, illness, death, loss, sorrow, defeat, and dejection. But you have got to separate that from mere physical suffering. Because what they're saying is the causes of all human the other sufferings we got in common with every other creature on this planet, we got in common with anything that moves, anything that lives, anything that has a nervous system. It hurts, it dies, it can be starved, but it does not suffer. It does not have pain and illusion based thereon. And so there has been a grand tradition, thousands of years in the East, and now, as I said, in parts in the West, of saying that the cause of all suffering all dissatisfaction, all of the irritants, uh, 
sometimes it just wrapped up and says, is, are the delusions of desire, the desires of seeking, trying to hold on to the impermanent. And it's all the same thing. There's a difference between having your leg cut and having your leg cut and commenting on it. If we were brute, moot beast still, if we were no more than dogs or wolves, and we broke a foot, you could not suffer in the same way a human does. Not to distract by any means to the pain that would, a wolf would be going through, but they cannot suffer as a man does. And there's a very subtle crack in this that I know some of you may already think I've gone through it too many times already. Tonight <laughs> is what I mean. But, no. You understand that the mystical tradition, and all of you have been influenced by it to some degree, and it's not misnamed, it is not misdirected, but it takes the approach of, it starts out with, man is suffering. And everyone comes to that trough somewhere through their religion, through their local cultural patterns, or through their attempt to pursue some extraordinary transcendental practice. That man suffers, that is the opening comment. After that, it's opened all sorts of interpretations. But the, it's to say that man suffers, the part that is overlooked to start with, is they're saying that man suffers in a unique way. And some of the would-be supplicants and pursuers of things Mr. Cow might say, oh yeah, yeah, I know that. And they don't. Because then they immediately confuse it by through such <clears throat> of the quotes I was sort of putting together in a great combined ball of saying that man suffers and is deluded by his suffering and that the sufferings are, and then they enumerate them. And I just sort of wrap them up into six or eight of age. And you can say, well, we can't help that. You know, illness, you can't help that. Death, you can't help that. Except they're talking about something else. Well, whether they are or not, you should understand it as something else. Because, yes, age and illness and death, you could say, are painful. But that is not unique to man. Dogs age, get ill, and die, right? Everybody knows that. So why is it unique to man? The uniqueness is that man comments on it. Well, we'll keep trying. Believe me, that makes all the difference in the world. And whether they understood it or not, <clears throat> whoever said it originally, I can assure you that you should understand it or else it's a waste of time to consider it because there is no way out. You cannot follow one of these ancient mystical traditions or a modern mystical tradition thinking that in some way through meditation, through starvation, through the chanting of some mantra that you will escape the suffering and delusion that is uniquely man. Not so. Because that cannot be escaped. The obvious ones, the ones I start out. Age, illness, and death. They simply can't be escaped. So what makes them unique? What is the one thing that can be escaped from what aspect of it? And that is the commenting thereon. The idea, and I have brought it back to your attention, that is much older than any of us, the idea of a reticent warrior, the strong, silent, self-contained, but the reticent warrior, as an external picturization, is simply the beginning. Because what you've got to do is become non-commental internally. Again, you have all the mystical traditions and parts of religion and even aspects of psychology. But all the mystical traditions say something about a man should learn to curb his tongue. That uh, the gods would either favor it or else his potential to experience the big experience will be greatly enhanced. If he will quit superfluous speech. And then they, after that they lapse into giving examples which ordinary drugstore run of the mill would be mystics insist on. Then they start saying you shouldn't gossip. You shouldn't lie. You shouldn't tell falsehoods about other people. You shouldn't try and defraud people even verbally. And it all sounds right because it is a cruder form of the original statement. That is, uh, cut down on superfluous talk. So then you end up with the kind of pictures. Thousands of years old, all the way up to today's modern icons and movies and etc. 
of the hero. Uh, nowadays, and at the crude level of culture, it is normally a physical hero, as we all know, a cop or a cowboy, a guy that pushes people around and has his way, is the medium for goodness, but he does it physically. But still, he, re he is represented always by being quite taciturn. Everybody around him can be blabbering. All the villains, all the bad guys, the ordinary, the king. The king himself that gives the knight the task to go out and do. The king just goes into huge, great descriptions of all he's got to do and goes on for page after page. And he says, do you understand? The knight goes, and that's it. And it strikes people that, yes, that's correct. That if this guy is heroic in some way, he is, he's simply not a blabbermouth. It's not... I don't know of any mystical tradition that they actually go that far to be point blank and say, Thou shalt not be a blabbermouth. Or, you know, knights do not palaver. But they're saying it in other ways, except they end up as always dealing with specifics, dealing with examples of don't lie, okay, don't gossip, okay. Don't tell falsehoods about your neighbor, okay. Don't bear fault with them, okay. Don't try and cheat people through verbal means, all right. When it should just be, don't talk too much. But that is very old. There are many. There are still people involved with that. There are schools. There would be mystical, uh, mystical traditions going on right now that that is at the heart of what they're doing. Whether they state it as one of the direct canons of what they're doing, it comes about indirectly through the practice itself to what the monasteries, the Zen schools, the Christian monasteries, of simply one of the rules, or the only rules, the only thing that they tell you, Art, you can come here and join us, don't talk. You know, go find yourself a bed, find yourself a bowl, don't talk. And when it gets a little more specific, I will point out that they do have a practice, generally, that from such and such hours we sit. We all get in a room and we sit. And what do we do besides sit? We don't talk. And then periodically it comes out, or people try to piece it together, that it's having to do something. It, that it has to do with trying to, in some way, curb and inhibit the kind of babbling that people normally do. People have been involved with that for lifetimes. I repeat what I just said. The visualization of an external reticent knight, reticent warrior, that picturization, that visualization, which is good enough and makes for interesting stories and you can use sort of as your own symbolic uh, icon to start with. But that is simply the beginning. As always, the whole idea that this kind of activity is out there somewhere. You have no choice but to start out like that. But that is simply the beginning to say that to have this picturization that it's external and that in some way and when I say external, I don't mean just external to you, but external vis-a-vis -vis you. That is, that what I'm after is someday, if I keep working on it, I'll get to the point that I don't blabber. <laughs> now, as many of you know that that is a quite serious affair. Uh, many of you will, I see you pull out your tongue or hairbrush when I mention about your own tongue, is the more you begin to understand what life's about, just the more you begin to understand the more often you feel as though right after you said something that, God, I wish I hadn't said that. And it's not necessarily the quality of what you said, the content. It was just, I wish I hadn't even opened my mouth. It's just, it's like I left my tongue. The old pictures of a guy coming out of the bathroom and toilet paper still stuck out of his pants. <laughs> it's like in some way your tongue is still tied to something unsavory. And the unsavoriness is what you just said. But even... Even the picturization of you being this reticent, sort of self-contained, silent warrior, silent, you know, wise person. That's just the beginning of this, actually. It's the inner commentary. There have been other mystics, or still mystical speakers. Uh, well, let me... Let me say something about psychologists. The ordinarily religious and the psychologically bent self-improverists. I don't have to spell that, do you? 
<laughs> That's my patented word. Psychologically bent or inclined, self-improverists. Well, the religious and that group, I was trying to give you a full spread there, they will concede that what a man says, what a man says, and consequently says to himself, or things, can be of significance, without any doubt. They will, they will concede that. Some of them state outright, but I say concede that even if it's not part of their dogma of some religion, if it's not part of the school of thought of some field in some area of psychology, they will concede it. Well, such as religion saying, you shouldn't have bad thoughts. You should not have, you know, if you're Jewish, you shouldn't have non-Jewish thoughts. And if you're Catholic, you shouldn't have non-Catholic thoughts. That you shouldn't have ungodly thoughts if you're going to be religious. And in psychology, those trying to improve themselves all the way from just cocktail self-improverist all the way to the fields of uh, professional psychiatry, they obviously will say that what a man thinks can be important is witnessed by people with phobias. That kind of psychotic or at least neurotic eat a fix that you keep thinking about the same thing over and over. You keep saying, you keep replaying your mother telling you, I wish you had never been born. She told you that one time when you were six years old and she was having a real bad day and just you know, cut her finger. <laughs> and yet you keep repeating this. And every time you see a picture of Madonna, both versions or whoever. <laughs> <laughs> we all know from common wisdom, I mean common conventional wisdom, religious to psychology, that it was conceded that what a man thinks can be of importance. And by think, of course, what they don't care any further is he is also speaking it. He is speaking it to himself. Again, one of the tricky subtle parts, if you'll allow me to try and help pave the pillow for you before you lay down on it. Once you begin to see what's going on, it's not a matter of what. It's to understand that all inner commentary, all inner commentary is detrimental. It's plain and simple. Might I say, too goddamn plain and simple for most people. It is not a part of the collective scenery the collective landscape of humanity. There were other mystics, what I was going to say, back in more specifically to the area in which we were interested. And they have tried to describe the experience itself as saying such things as my mind, and I'm giving a fairly good wrap up now from all the way from the Middle East, 6,000, B.C., right up until today, but most people I know take the tradition of such mystical approaches of being very ancient, and that that's where they're interested. But this is a wrap-up of at least a good 8,000 years worth, that they will say such things as, again, I'm not questioning it, just they will say, my mind, speaking of the experience, my mind was freed from the grasp of passing passion. My mind, you know, of temporary thought. And it was freed from the routine violence, from its routine violence and ignorance, which about covers it. That's about the cure, you might say, from the early one I mentioned, of them trying to describe what are the pains, what are the causes of the pains unique to man. So now a man who has had the experience, and he describes it, 8,000, 9,000 years worth of men describing it, and they say, my mind was freed from the grasp of temporary passion, temporary thought. They always, they won't come out and say it. But my mind was freed from it at that time. Of course, they're describing it after the fact. Again, I'm not questioning it. It's a good description. It's the only reason I'm using it and putting them all together. My mind was freed from the grasp of temporary passion and freed from its normal, its routine violence and ignorance. I mean, what else could you want? <laughs> what they're describing. How about this? What is that description? Other than what used to be real in the original description of enlightenment, that is seeing things as they are, not your comments thereon. Uh, may I refresh your memory? We're now not talking 
or you should not be listening simply on the basis of when I say your comments there on. I don't mean the lips moving. Your brain has a tongue. <laughs> Enlightenment, even though I started out and admitted or said that the historic still prevailing attitude is that the experience is indescribable, which is why it's the experience that's indescribable. But the general description of the experience was, I see things as they are, or I saw things as they are. But notice, again, putting it together, giving you a condensed version from many sources and many thousands of years, I saw things, or they can say life, but I saw things as they are. They didn't say I saw my mind. Contrary. I just got through pointing out that one of the other descriptions, they, when they're apparently being subjective and talking about their part of the experience, they say, when I was there, my mind was freed from the temporary hold of just the passing passions, just the temporary passions that flow through us all. My mind was freed from it just being pulled here and there and was no longer, right that time, a victim of its own routine violence and ignorance. The other side of that, you could say, is what I'm trying to describe now, is what enlightenment was originally described as, was simply seeing things, having the mind in such a position that you saw things as they are. Not, I saw my mind as it was, I saw things as they were. I would try it sideways. If the experience cannot be described, and yet I said that there are two ways to look at it, there is the experience and there is the getting there. And that's not a play on words, it is, there is the practice, be one way the older traditions would have put it, there is the practice and there is the payoff, or there is the practices or the practice, most schools limit it to one, and then the payoff, the experience, the enlightenment, the moment. So if the experience itself, by all accounts, and me not naysaying it, cannot be described, the practice can, the way there can. Now where people normally get caught, as far as most people care to go, is the practice can be described because that's what the practice is. That is what the apparent school is. That's what the effort is. The practice is meditation. The practice is prayer. The practice is uh, movement. The practice is physical labor. But let's take the most obvious one, meditation. That they say the practice, and they will admit it, always have. I mean, they got no choice. But they say there are two things now, if you're going to join up to some school 6,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, or today, and you find a certain school, and their practice was meditation. They would say, now the practice is what we do is we sit. And they probably have their own name for it, and they say we sit, and they may have a small other thing is we sit in a certain way, we sit in a certain position, the full lotus, or we sit in a certain position, and you know, we half open our eyes, half close our eyes, we stare in a certain place, and we just sit. And that's after you've already assumed, and they might admit, that what I want is enlightenment. And they say, well, that's what we all do. You know, welcome to the club. Well, I heard that you guys, this is a place that that's all you do. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> you know? Well, we clean up the place, and we make the beds, and we eat some. But, yeah, that's what we're here for. So, and he, you say, well, I'd like to join. They say, okay. So... <laughs> They, they will not guarantee, they admit, just simply, I'm not trying to play with words, that the experience itself is not the same as the practice. And so, and they all say, well, here's what it is. It's like that you want to be Mr. America, and to do that, you got to work out. Or you want to win a Nobel Prize in physics? Hey, first off, it's just almost a, a given. You're going to have to get some kind of training in physics. 
So, but even at levels that seem to be beyond the mundane, there is an obvious difference between the payoff, the experience, and the practice. But there's a point. I know I'm back where verbally, I've already passed 30 minutes ago, but listen. The experience cannot be described and just give it up. The only people who describe it is after the fact, and the best of them even say, hey, this isn't it. But God damn, I want to tell somebody, so here it is. Now, I'm telling you, this is not it. It doesn't even satisfy me, but here it is. And I wrapped it up for you. But all they say is, the real experience, they start off and say, it is indescribable. But you should buy that, but now you should accept that, but now because that's what makes it the big E. If it's describable, you know, what the hell? You go buy it. You read in the book. The practice... The way there can be described, comma, not period, because it's not sitting and it's not fasting. Because anything that can be described, uh, you've already hurt yourself. That is, if you accept the description. I started out and said that the experience is one thing, the getting there is something else. And although the experience can, is indescribable, the getting there can be, see, I didn't say described, if you, those of you who are listening. I said can be generally outlined. And the main way it is outlined is by what, is by describing those things, by knowing those things that will definitely, all the way from hinder to bar you from changing your position, from getting any closer to the experience. Which is where all of the commandments and religions come from, is where the Directives, the negative directives having to do with human nature comes from, from all the mystical traditions. But look at the Ten Commandments. You don't have to be Christian or a Jew. Or you can look at the uh, things from Buddhism. You can look at any of the major religions and anything that they say that here are some of the things that will absolutely keep you from successfully pursuing our religion, from pleasing our God, is you can't do those things. And the very things they're pointing out are those things that are detrimental to the experience. So they are already outlined, but they are given as examples. And they end up being practices, and they are not practices. They're outlines. People begin to take, now you have heard this now probably all your life, and you've heard it from me, and you think you know what it is, is you mistake the journey for the destination. You mistake the map for getting there. And it's not because you're stupid. It's because of the way the nervous system works. Is once you say, thou shalt not lie. If some mystical tradition, if you went to join a school and they say, well, we sit, we meditate, and you went, well, I hope, you know, I'm, I'm with that. And they say, and then the, we only have one rule. You cannot lie. And they might want to elaborate a little bit. Maybe after you've been there 10 years and they call you on your birthday, they elaborate a little bit. But they just say, you cannot lie, and you accept it. Which is just don't talk too much. But they can say, do not lie. And so you can sit there for the next 10 years and meditate on do not lie. And do not lie takes on an importance, not that it doesn't deserve, but it takes on an importance that is now painful and illusionary. Mm -hmm. The very thing that you're trying to escape from. Mm -hmm. Because it is not the what. It is not saying, well, you shouldn't lie. Mm -hmm. And it's not even that you shouldn't talk too much with these lips. Mm -hmm. It's for these lips. It's up here you shouldn't lie. And how does a real warrior, just forgive me if we keep saying that so we don't have to play with words, where do you lie? How do you lie? Very simple. Inner commentary. It's not what. It's not what comment you make on reality, on life. It's any comment. This may point out some of the roaring success we've had over the last several nights of me saying that all the apparent questions and problems of life have no correct or incorrect answers or solutions until, until they're brought up, mentioned, asked about, noted. Besides there being, it being possible to say that there is the experience which we can't describe. Shouldn't be tried. And the getting there, which can be generally outlined, uh, let me see if I can enrich it. We could say that there are two 
general approaches to people historically, forget the people, historic approaches to the experience. One of them would seem to be the kind of approach that would apparently be based on subduing, subduing mental activity, such as meditation, such as sitting, and they may be a little more specific and say, not only sit, but what we're attempting to do is focus our attention, and if you're sitting in a lotus position, some point on the floor right in front of you, or they can even turn it internally and say, I'm trying to focus my attention, I'm mentally, even though I can't look down and see it, I'm trying to picture a place right between my pelvic region and my navel that I am actually trying to, what, what it amounts to is I'm trying to subdue my mentation, to calm the mind. The other view is not normally referred to, has not been, and if it ever is, which it will be in the West compared to the allegorical East, would seem to be almost the other side of a continual talking about it, which I could say that what we're doing now is not that far removed from it. It is a form of, as opposed to the more historic, that we're almost trying to starve the mind, trying to do something, trying to clear consciousness, trying to clear the mind, trying to have the experience, and in some way we're trying to cut out the kind of passing passions that drive men and distract them, the very things I was quoting of the 8,000 years worth of mystics of saying that they experience, and them after it saying, well, my mind was freed from blah, blah, blah. At the method of apparently, I'm making my own descriptions of it now, of apparently subduing, trying to deprive the mind of ordinary stimulation, such as through meditation, such as through withdrawing from the world and putting yourself under monastic conditions. That's one way. It's not right or wrong. That has been the way. The other, which is now gaining some widespread use more than it was, would seem to be of a stimulating of the intellect, which is not that different, but it would seem to be rather than just a retiring and sitting there alone and they say, all right, go sit and in 10 years we'll check with you. Just sit, this is the way our founder, this is the way other people that we know for a fact in our lifetime, in our monastery, in our tradition, people have had the experience and all they did, we're doing the exact same thing that monk so and so did. The string of monks, the string of people who have been here, all they did was sit at least X hours a day, still, and they meditated. That's all they did, and it's worked. That's all I can tell you. So there you are. You have apparently the practice and the apparent payoff, the experience that has occurred, and the only thing they can attribute to is the practice. But it would apparently, you follow what I'm saying, and it's not an attack. I'm just trying to describe it in a way that's never been described. It is in a form, it's subtle, that is, as opposed to just abject, it is a kind of weaning, it is a kind of deprivation, gradual and slow, and not absolute, but a kind of mental deprivation, a subduing, not of just the mind, because they admit that, trying to calm the mind, but it's like a subduing of the stimuli. Why else would you go sit with just you and four or five other people? Or in a real orthodox monastery, if there was such a thing, everybody's got their own little room. You don't even come out eight hours a day and sit with the other guys. Even though you never speak and you never look at them, you just sit in your room. It is a kind of subduing, it is a kind of narrowing down of the kind of stimuli that apparently runs the mind. Which, you know, makes sense if the point is to calm the mind and that's the practice that will bring about the experience. But any time, as you people are supposed to know by now, any time that one thing can apparently work, the opposite will work. But it is not, in other words, and, and rather than sort of retiring from the kind of stimuli that runs the mind ordinarily, and as the mystics have always said when they describe it after the fact of saying what well, the experience was, the payoff was, the beauty of it was my mind was freed from, and they describe the kinds of things, the very kinds of things that do ordinarily stimulate the mind. It's ordinary uh, acclamation, propensity to violence, to ignorance, to latching on to whatever passing whim is just flowing through you, taking it as being permanent. So it sounds like, well, the very thing to do, it would be like trying to calm a wild beast. It's starve it. Cut down its food. Pin it up so it can't jump around. And finally, maybe, it will calm down and turn into something else. Turn into what we want. But if that be true, if that have any validity, then its opposite does. 
And that is like a kind of barrage, a kind of extra stimulation intellectually, which uh, there is no great tradition. And as you notice, never behind me do we ever have a picture of a founder or who I got this from or you know, why this approach is guaranteed to work. No more than Zen or uh, monastic schools that are 8,000 years old. They got that much on me, but there's no more guarantee that that will work. But this sort of thing is sort of like an overstimulation. That is an unnecessary intellectual stimulation. And you got to admit it. Now, I know some of you have sit here long enough and you find it interesting, but I've, I'll be the first one to point out, not for any sham humility, but to point out that this sort of activity, or me talking, let's just put it to me right quick, this kind of method is certainly not necessary. You cannot say that in any particular way it's uh, solve problems in your life, not specifically. And you cannot say that people out there are dying for it in the same way the ordinary religion would say, for instance, they say, well, the world is dying, literal, uh, figuratively at least, that they are starving, that they are far from the will of the gods, and that I know what they should be doing, come listen to me. Now, they're not missing this because it is truly extraneous. It is truly impertinent. It is truly unnecessary. Now, I don't mean just uninteresting because it is uninteresting to ordinary people. But it's not just uninteresting. It's even if they hear it, it's uh, kind of little jokes I've made that in a sense uh, gives many people headaches. It irritates them because it's overstimulation. Not that I'm so much better and they're so much worse. It's not that kind of contest. It's just that they get stimulated if they listen at all and they're not even sure what the point is. And they just think, you know, I got some kind of worm got in my ear or something, you know, life, you know. I don't, I don't fool with this. It is in a sense overstimulation compared to a kind of subduing or a kind of weaning of intellectual stimulation that has been the historic monastic retiring from life kind of approach. But now consider, let me go back to the original approach, the historic approach. Uh, I am not trying to take the mystery out of any of this because uh, enough of you now have been fooling around with me in this long enough that enough of you have had the experience. That I don't have to say anything else, I don't have to describe it, and you certainly know that it cannot be described. And all you can do when people have heard me or I've been connected with in the past, have had the experience of me on the other side of the world, and afterwards they only say one thing, that boy, they wish they could have gotten their hands on me that night or for how many hours it lasted. They didn't have anything to say. They knew that. They didn't have anything to ask, but they just thought, well, you know, hell, there's nobody else. You know, I wish I'd get it, my hands on him or I could go there right quick so I could just walk in because I know he'd see it on my face, which I would. <laughs> so he could just go... You know, we could sit down or go out for a walk or go get a, you know, have a Coke or something. But that's about it. So you know it's indescribable. And you know what it is and you don't need a sales pitch. But let's go back to the mystical, the ancient mystical, the traditional methods, as opposed to this, because I know this has seemed so hit and miss, especially, well, specifically for anyone who has not actually had the experience they may still find this interesting and it may still seem to be the right course and they may still feel like, well, I'll keep you know, hanging around this until I find something better until I decide it's not what I'm after. But back to the, what has been the traditional methods, and let's just put it this way, of trying to calm the mind. And the method has been what would seem at first blush to be the most reasonable. That is to get away from things if we're going to consider without any qualitative judgment and no attack on life that you're not a religious fanatic of some kind, that we're not attacking life, but that you understand that the kinds of things that run ordinary minds, it, you just hear it. As soon as someone points out the first time, it should have happened to you many years ago, before you met, ever ran across me, you could see it in a book, that they simply point out the kind of things that drive ordinary people. And it's in religion. Maybe you even heard it inside your religion. They didn't know what they were talking about anymore. But they say the kinds of things that drive ordinary people, just ordinary carnal drives, of ordinary man are the things we've got to overcome. And maybe somewhere in a book, or maybe you were good enough that you went, wait a minute. It's not for any kind of moralistic purposes. All they're saying is it just keeps you in a certain mental state. And that's not what I'm after because I've been in this mental state all my life, whether you were 15 at the time or 20 or 30. So you know what that is. It's just me. 
But it does seem to be tied to what goes on out here because I can wake up in the morning and for the first few seconds feel pretty good until the radio comes on, they say, and the warfare, the gunfire has started back on the West Bank or back in Bosnia. And you go, those idiots. Forget the idiots. Forget people killing each other, whatever it is. Or the stock market is Christ because so-and-so sold off all of his stock and you started about some kind of conspiracy and how much. Not that. Not if you're any good. That's ordinary people. If you're any good at this, you, you finally understand that what goes on in life out there runs right through me, as the, one of the mystics used to say, like, <sighs> like ground pork through a goose. That it runs right through me, and this is my mind. This is my consciousness. Again, assuming that you're good enough that you're no longer tied up with the idea that your soul, that there's something inside of you other than your mind that makes you unique, that makes you you. Again, I point out to you, whether they knew it or not, 8,000 years ago, they knew that it was the mind. And then it got variations here and there, and now it's... You will not find anybody in the West, anybody religious, and damn few people in the East anymore, that if you said that the only thing, the spiritual spark, the unique spark in man is his mind, out in the world, nice people, perhaps your own parents, uh, that has very limited currency. They go, no, 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 no. But it's always been known by those who knew anything. That's the mind. It would seem to be what we're saying that you finally come to a point that you do understand in some way on your own that this thing is me. This thing is all the dreams I have. This thing is all the fun I have besides the good fun down here, the ordinary fun of being alive besides taking nothing from that. But this is where the mystical hunger is, here, only here. So it's obvious that that's where it must be fed. Then you figure out, all right, if it cannot be directly fed, I cannot jump from here to the experience, but it can be outlined. Mm -hmm. The people who have done it, and it can be outlined, and even when you hear it, you just know, well, somewhere in there, that's, that's generally correct. There's nothing to debate. You hear the outline, and you understand the outline through such. I'll read back again to my condensed Reader's Digest version, is that the pain, and they describe, and is in general this, of being tied to the transient world without any qualitative judgment now, not because sex is bad, not because money is bad, not because car is bad, it's because anything out there, if that's what your mind's tied to, you know, it's that. <laughs> I mean, just, it's that. That's the nature of life. Your body's tied to it in the same way, except within a very limited response spectrum, which is just off and on. But here, it just, you know, you're just jerked here and there, and people finally realize, all right, that is it. So then the obvious one, back to the traditional practice and approach, the obvious one is all right, to calm the mind. And you just, well, okay, so we got to do that, and then they can go a little further, and it still sounds correct, that that has got to be, if it's not immediate enlightenment, if it's not the immediate experience, that's got to be the absolute minimum. That's got to be the absolute necessary prerequisite that you've got to get your mind calm. You can't imagine suddenly being involved was screaming at your broker, your insurance salesman over some claim that they wouldn't do. Can you, you can't even picture this, not a real person, not a would-be real knight. You cannot picture being in the midst of that and suddenly the experience just come upon you. <laughs> that I was suddenly enlightened in the middle of raising hell about this tire blowing out after only 8,000 miles and I paid, you know, damn near $20 for it. <laughs> So when you hear the idea of the practices, such as meditation, or you even hear the description is that the point of the meditation, that they say this is not the experience, but they say the attempt, we're going to sit and is try and focus your attention. Try and sit for hours, don't talk. And either think on a, you know, some mandala somewhere, some picture, some icon, or just focus your attention. Just try and sit still. And if you, went, if you looked a little bit, and they go, well, the point is to calm the mind. So in some way... And they might give you this much. Now, so, so we can reflect the cosmic force, the truth. But we've got to stop this kind of just blah, blah, blah. And you think, that is true. That's true. The reality of it is so simple. It's so in your face. It's why for the last six months I've been using the terms like in your face and point blank. 
it's nothing new. It's not like I just discovered it, but it's just not, its description is no longer of any great, or any particular great use. You have all of these methods from, in the past, a great historical one of meditating, sitting, trying to calm the mind. There is a more active form of the same thing that, uh, and even in your lifetime, some of you may know, there was a man from the Middle East in this century that came up with the description was just captivating to many, many, many people called self-remembering. It was like an active form. It's the other side of sitting and meditating. It was like, it's just another description, not to discount it because he caught many people's attention with this. We came into this part of the world and he ended up into the heart of the West, including America. And the term was that the, his practice was what you have to do. That's not the experience of being awake. That was his term for the experience or it's been many people's terms, but he said, the point is you're trying to awaken from this kind of dreamy existence, this kind of ordinary, mundane state of mind. And he said the practice, what, you know, the practice was to be able to self-remember, and he simply described it as no matter what else was going on, that you held a continuing awareness. Wherever you were, whatever you're doing, is simply that inside I'm here. And that's all. That's all you worry about. Which was, as always, when anything's good, it is a new version one more time, not taking away from it, but it's the same thing as trying to remember the breath of God, trying to do anything. Do you understand it's like a parapathetic, it's a moving about form of sitting, of meditation, that in the midst of life, rather than you retiring from life in a monastery and sitting there, it's as though in your own consciousness you're trying to construct a kind of monastery that no matter what I do, I got to get up and I'm going to go to work, I'm not going to a monastery, I can't, but I don't want to, whatever. But throughout the day, it's like internally, I have a monk. I have a monk sitting, and all he does, and it's the same thing, remember, that they used to describe two actual monks, or still do. All right, what you do is sit. Is there any questions? And the guy, and the student, the would-be joiner says, well, you say I just sit. Yeah, you sit, and you stare at the point right between your, you know, where your legs are crossed, six inches in front of you, and don't talk. Don't ever talk until we ever speak to you. Well, what else? Well, that's all. Just do that. You say, okay. The idea of trying to remember yourself, the trying to hold a form of objective consciousness, or the, one of the original versions, trying to remember God with each and every breath. But the idea, you understand, is inside of your own consciousness, which, well, let's get to a point, to your brain, to your mind, is you are, you are establishing a sitting monk. And to say, well, the object is, or the practice is, self-remember. Never forget that you exist apart from whatever's going through you, whatever passions, whatever intellectual notions, whatever pains, whatever aches, whatever sorrows, whatever fears, angers. Just remember that you're there, which is a form, is in your mind, you're of establishing a monastery, that there is apparently no point to it. This is the practice, remember, not the experience. But you've got this monk now, and you're calling instead of a monk and sitting, you're calling it self-remembering, that he is sitting there, and you say, well, well yeah, but what's the point? You back to the kind of monk. He'd say, well, what's the point? And they say, well, the point is to sit there. And the practice is conducive to the experience. So these kind of moving about, non-retiring forms of like self-remembering, you are trying to calm the mind. Now, it sounds different. It always has to sound different. That's why this keeps going. It's calm the mind. Back to one of the subtle parts. Again, I'm going to try to get you to separate. It strikes people that have any interest in this at all. If you said one of the most important things is don't talk so much, no matter who they are. If you say just don't talk so much, you can get a little more specific, but most of you by now, you, you just know it's right. Not because I said it. You just know I do. It's not because you're offending the gods. It's because it does something to the mind. It keeps the mind in its natural state. The state it is now. Oh, you should know that. There is a direct link because it's your mind talking. And it is, uh, to use a picture of the calming, to use a picture of trying to just objectively, impartially remember that inside I'm somebody. I don't know what, but I am a something. And I am not whatever is passing through me, and I'm not whatever I might be inclined to yammer about. So one of the things is don't yammer. Cut down on talk. The part that's very hard to peel apart, the part that's right in your face, 
which if I get any closer, some of you might see how apropos it was. I use the term in your face, even though I didn't make it up, because it is, by God, in your face. <laughs> and if you get a little bit better, it's not just in your face. It's in where you kind of peel it. If you can begin to separate it, it's right there. That is, that it has nothing to do with what you're saying internally. It has nothing to do with the run, running commentary that goes on. It is your mind breathing. It's the same. You can hear your lungs breathe. You do not have to have emphysema. You can listen and you can hear yourself breathe. The mind talks to itself. It is it breathing. But you are so used to it, you do not hear it. And it has nothing to do with what you think if there's any possibility of you having the experience, if you actually belong in this. This is the part that will throw everybody almost because you will end up in the practice of some sort, end up folding the map, looking at it, unfolding it, refolding it. <laughs> it's what their mind comments on is of absolutely no importance other than this. It's detrimental. It's deleterious. And an ordinary mind would say, well, what part? Yeah. Read my bush. I said what I meant. Well, <laughs> you realize I went 57 minutes without any theatrical sarcasm? <laughs> the ordinary mind cannot conceive of the fact that whatever it comments on, the inner commentary, which you take as being, well, an ordinary person takes as being themselves. For me to mention the uselessness a partisan thought, and yet it's the basis of all thought. For me to keep, in a sense, decrying polar-based thought in a 3D world, which under ordinary conditions is all that's possible, the point being, not to make somebody think, well, uh, this is insane, or else to think, well, you're right, I do think that way, and shame on me, I can't stop it. See, as soon as you say, shame on me, I can't stop it, uh, it's like you tried to kill a hobby, tried to kill a vice you've got by bringing in another vice to say any comment you have about life is deleterious. Any comment you have is anti-practice no matter what your practice is. It is suicidal. All of the practices, let me wrap them up right quick, all the way from if you were in a kind of Eastern school, and they said, well, come sit. The experience, what you've heard about, this is what we're after. We're here working as hard as you can. We're working 24 hours a day, trying to do it in our sleep. So come join us. You're welcome. All you got to do, come in, sit, don't talk. Sit, don't talk, and that's it. And all the way from that, Two, trying to remember yourself, trying to have an objective recollection of reality, but trying to remember yourself. That about covers it because that's still popular now. There's schools all over the world, in the Western world, that that's their basis, trying to constantly self-remember. So you can say that that's kind of an active for somebody out in the world, all the way from that to the guy who's retired and in the monastic life just sitting. Both of them would believe that it has a specific point to do with this. They say, well, yes, the comet. And you say, but exactly what parts? Or what are you trying to do with the mind? Uh, they might not really respond. They might not understand the question put that way. But if I said, all right, a lot of what you think is so biased, is so tied to your own mechanical emotions, that's so tied to just the workings of the external world, it's just so tied to God knows what subconscious traumas that you've had, that we've had collectively in our human consciousness, our subconscious, that these kind of things happen, and they have got to be seen to. Yes, yes. They do not have to be seen to. That's where people cannot strip it. That's where it is in your face. It does not matter what your comment is. It does not matter what your inner commentary is. It is not a selective smorgasbord that you have to go in and find out, well, all right, now I think some of my 
think some of my thoughts about whatever it is, sex, violence, life, other people, responsibility, name anything, go through the dictionary. And you say, well, some of what I think, without any doubt, uh, I should change. I should work on it. And I should be, indeed, a self-improverist. I was going to wrap it up with a, give you a new version. I'm sure I'll weaken and pick this back up into some detail, but I, I sure would like to just do it and stop. But if I was going to do that, I would have done it years ago and just did it and stopped. And everybody would still be staying there, those that really had any potential. You'd still be staying where I left you, you know, 10 or 50 years ago going, <laughs> just knowing that was, God, that's it. But, and you'd keep waiting, well, well what's the rest? And you're afraid to look up because you, you already suspect I left. <laughs> All right, I'm going to close and give you this. and I may pick, I'm sure in some way I'll pick it back up whether I ever say the words again. But I'm going to tell you the immediate method that works now and that is faster. They're always faster. It's not that I'm the only one that ever figured out how to do something or ever knew how, but every time it's got to be alive to be fast, to be efficient. It has nothing to do with the content of the inner commentary. It has to do with the inner commentary. And rather than, well, I'll go around and I'll always remember the 10,000 names of God or the one name of God. I'll keep saying Shiva, Vishnu. I'll keep thinking, I'll keep picturing Buddha. I'll keep picturing some mandala, some drawing from a Tibetan cave. Or I'll keep just trying to remember I'm here, I'm here, self-remembering. What if I told you, what if it turned out that the one, that the ultimate secret mantra, mantra of a real knight is simply, or perhaps not so simply, that's another story, but it simply would be this, shut up. <laughs> but Wait, the mantra now, always keep in mind what I was trying to lead you to. Not a mantra directed to an external deity. Shut up. No commentary to the commentary, no judgment. There's no weighing about, why, why am I so hostile toward uh, tall people? Why am I so hostile toward men? Why am I so... Why do I feel this kind of anger every time I see a fat person that seems to be rich? I'm telling you, I, I put it as a, perhaps the ultimate mantra, but I'm telling you that that is the method. It is all inclusive. Not directed. Not a supplication. Not a prayer. Not a beg for help. It is not a practice that's directed externally. But it's certainly not a mantra directed externally. <coughs> And it is, it's the practice, it is the method. There are no conditions, there are no asterisks to it for me to pick up. It's to your own commentary, is shut up. It is directly tied also, not that one causes the other, but to not staring. All staring is comment. It's simply shut up. And I didn't even put an exclamation mark. I didn't holler, shut up. It's sh shut up. Whatever the inner commentary is, is absolutely deleterious to this. Mm -hmm. Shut up. 